to an ever increasing, ever increasing faith. Grow in godliness. Grow in godliness. We walk by faith, not by sight. By faith, not by sight. Welcome to ever-increasing faith. Remember these words from the book of Romans, chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Praise God for another day, and for another privilege and opportunity to share with you the living word of God. I need your continued faithful financial support if ever-increasing faith television is to remain on the air in your area. On the screen is an address where you can mail your tithe offering or gift of love. Let me take this opportunity to thank you so very much for your past, your present, and whatever future support you are led to give, remember, you are helping to make it happen. All right, two openings, please. Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. And Ephesians chapter 6. Romans 4, Ephesians 6. Now, uh, <clears throat> it was interesting about the young man of 95. Uh, I thought about this when they were announcing his retirement. I, I hope he, I don't, there must be a reason, but I hope he doesn't retire because retirement is the worst enemy to life that there is. That's true. You know, you need, you got to do something to stay alive. I mean, it's okay, take some rest days, take some time off, you know, take a vacation and all that, but don't stop doing something. I will never retire. You know, retire, retire like I'm going to sit on the rocking chair, <laughs> watch the birds, or right. stuff like That's that. Right. Anyway, That's right. I hope he doesn't stop. All right, <clears throat> Romans chapter 4 and Ephesians chapter 6, if you have it, say, I have it. All right, let's begin reading in Romans, the fourth chapter. These are our foundation scriptures. Beginning at verse 17, it says, As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations, in the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives light to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did, who, contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants or seed be. And not being weak in what? He did not consider his own body, already dead, since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver or stagger at the promise of God to unbelief, but was strengthened or strong in what? Faith. Giving glory to God and being fully convinced or persuaded that what he, that is God, had promised, he, God, was also able to perform. We see two words in juxtaposition to each other, weak and strong, both words were applied to faith. So that would say to me that somewhere between weak and strong you could be, and or you could be weak or you could be strong. So he said, it says that Abraham, 100 years old, Sarah, 90 years old, received a promise from God by being strong in faith. So obviously faith had something to do with the promise of God. God may give a promise, but that promise is not automatic. There's something on our part that we have to do. Now, I haven't said this before, or it's been many years since I said it, but in reference to what we're talking about, the subject I'll announce in just a moment, there are two kinds of promises found in the Word of God. How many? Two kinds of promises. One kind is called a promised promise, and the other kind is called an offered promise. Promised promises are made by God, and it doesn't matter if you believe it or not, it shall be so. But offered promises for their fulfillment is depending upon, dependent upon what we do. For instance, a promise promise is that on the day that Jesus ascended back to the right hand of the Father, and the angels were there, and the apostles were there, and uh, the, the, the angel said, why do you gaze up into heaven? This same Jesus that you see go into heaven 
So she'll come, so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. It doesn't matter whether you believe that or not. That will be so. That's going to happen. That's a promise, promise. Doesn't matter what we believe. We can believe it, but our believing does not alter it in any way. Now, an offered promise is a promise that's dependent upon us for its fulfillment. For instance, God says, give and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. That's an that's a offered promise. Now, if I believe that and act on it, then I'll receive the benefit. But if I don't, and that's why many don't, because they don't believe it. See, it's offered, but it's up to you whether you receive it or not, and then do what it says. Are you following? The difference between offered and promised promises. All right. God made a promise to Abraham. The Bible says because he was strong in faith, it brought that promise into manifestation because it, if it was automatic, then Abraham, it wouldn't have had to mention anything about Abraham's faith. If God said you're going to have a child, you're going to have a child. <laughs> believe it or don't believe it. But apparently faith was involved in the promise coming to pass. Now, let's go to Ephesians, the sixth chapter, and we see something else. <clears throat> Abraham was not weak in faith, but he was strong in faith. Okay? Now, you know, <laughs> every once in a while, you know, you, you, as a person, as an individual, you think about where you are in life, what your mission is, what your assignment is, etc. And uh, it, it seems like all I ever talk about, really not though, because if you go back and look through all of my messages and books and so forth and so on, I teach on all kinds of things, but it seems like preeminent and prominent is the subject of faith because that's my assignment. Now, nobody has a problem with the gynecologist. All he does is the same thing over and over and over again. Same old, same old, same old. He ain't on chain. And, it, and thank God he does that. You can count on him, right? Huh? The pediatrician. I, I haven't heard of any pediatrician working on horses. Same old thing. Kids, children, what? So, this is my assignment. I don't even know why I said that, but it just came up. <laughs> Amen. Amen. I wasn't in the, it's not in the message. All right. Ephesians chapter 6, if you have a say, I have it. Verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be something. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Be that. And the only way we can be strong in the Lord is by being strong in faith. Just like with Abraham. So he tells me to be that, as I've said before, if he tells me to be that, two primary things are involved. Number one, that must be the will of God for me. That's God best for me to be strong. And secondly, it implies I can be that. So if I'm not that, all I need to do is go look in the mirror. I'm the problem. <laughs> so we're talking about how do you do this? If God says, be strong, what do I have to do or what can I do or what do I need to do to be that? And funny, we, 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 we don't have a problem with that in all other areas of life. We want to be strong physically, physically. We know we go to the fitness center, the gym. We get certain things we do, you know. We want to be strong intellectually, whether we keep feeding our minds with intellectualism, things we study, so forth and so on, program our mind with information. But when it comes to strong in the things of God, there must be ingredients involved. I found out that the strong seem to rise to the top. You know, like the cream, right? it rise, seems to rise to the top. So I decided back in 1970 that I would be strong because he, so, he told me I could be that. Up to that time, nobody told me I could do anything. They, didn't say, they said I didn't qualify. But I've been doing this for a number of years now. Works like a charm. So I'm not going to stop. So we're talking about six principles to obtaining strong faith. I mean, how do I do it? What do I need to do? What ingredients do I need to incorporate into my life? So we're talking about six principles to obtaining strong faith. Anybody want to be strong? Yeah. All right. Well, to those that want to be, I am speaking to you. All right. Principle number one we left off last time is we must know. I pointed this out. All of the six ingredients start out with we must know the reality of. Then colon, and then I'll put in there what we must know. Not think, not hope, no, 
We, we must know certain things if we're going to get the maximum benefit. Now, principle number one, we must know the reality of the Word of God. This is not just a holy relic. This is not just a compilation of ancient traditions. This is the Word of God to us. Well, how do you know that, Apostle? Like I always say, how do you know it's not? You don't. And you won't until you do what it says and let it fail. Arguing, debating, not going to change anything. Your, your opinion is irrelevant. Mine is immaterial. It's what does it say? Well, the best way to find out that it's not true, just do what it says. And if it's not true, it's going to fail. It won't work. It won't produce. It won't compute, right? Real simple. So this is where we're starting. We're starting out with the premise that it is true. So we must know the reality of the Word of God. We've already looked at several things. We ended up last time in Ephesians and Matthew 4. Ephesians 6, Matthew 4. So let's go there and we'll take off. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 4 and Ephesians chapter 6. We must know the reality of the Word of God. This is God talking to Fred. Yeah, you have to always make it personal. This is God talking to me. I don't know what he's talking to you about <laughs> or if he's talking to you. I, he's talking to me. You know, that's the attitude you have to have. Otherwise, you get into speculation and then you'll just be wiped out. Now, I want to share. You like good news? Yeah. Okay. All this, all this, these things I've been teaching and all this stuff I've been talking about, faith, faith, faith. Uh, I received this letter which is just a good practical illustration of the reality of it in an individual's life who took what they heard and operated in it. And it produced positive results in their lives. So this might be an encouragement to you. So Dr. Price, I've been expectingly, expectingly waiting to write this letter. You are such a blessing in my life. The reason I said waiting is because I have been standing for the manifestation of what I had been believing God for. I worked for a large company that had a contract with another large company. I was assigned to work on that contract for four years. May this year, 2010, is the end of that four-year contract. The company I worked for did rebid the work, but lost to a competitor. We, the employees on the contract, were informed the beginning of March that our jobs would be going away May 31st. That's not good news, is it? Well, after being under your teaching for several years and experiencing the faithfulness of God for myself, I knew God was going to perform in some kind of way to keep me employed. I didn't know how, I didn't know where, but I knew he was going to make a way for me, personal. Okay, so it was the beginning of March. We were told we wouldn't have a job. Well, right then and there, I said to myself, huh, not me. I'm going to have a job. It'll be with the company I work for or somewhere, somewhere else. I believe that in my heart. I believe that in my heart. I went home, told my husband, and the faith fight was on. I pulled out my Bible, opened it up to hear what God had to say about it and his promises regarding this situation. Knowing that his word prospers where it is sent, I found out and started claiming that. He keeps me alive in famine, recession in brackets, Psalm 33, 19, that he knows my work and what kind of work I do, and he has sent before me, set before me an open door to employment which no one can shut, Revelation 3, 8. I'm blessed in the field of my work, Deuteronomy 28, 3. I was determined that because the company I worked for lost to a competitor that I was not going to lose. I listened to my CDs every day, every day in capital letters, especially the one you taught on what faith is and what is not. Number six, and faith is acting on the word, number five. I pulled out my old tapes of your teachings, including FP887. <laughs> I grabbed my book, Name It and Claim It. My husband and I continued to tithe and give and praise God for all he has done, all he is going to and, and all he is going to do. I started looking for a position inside and outside of the company. Well, to make a long story short, I have been offered a position within the company I work for. My business manager came to me that same week and said, there's an area that needs 30% of your time. I figured, okay, 30%. I kept looking for a job and supported the other 
area 30% of the time. Well, while working in that 30% time frame, the management in that area told me their plans were to open a requisition for the position in May for a full-time person. And I asked and asked if I would be interested. I looked at the lady and said, are you serious? <laughs> yes, I'm interested. This position came to me seven miles from home. I got a 3% increase effective mid-March from my old position and that salary followed me to my new position. I kept my vacation and personal time off. God is faithful. His word does not return to him void, Isaiah 55, 11. My husband and I are praising God. Since my accepting the position within the company, remember now, I had already posted my resume inside and outside the company. I have had another area within the company call me to schedule an interview, ASAP. They called and emailed me. I replied by email informing them that I had already been offered and accepted another position within the company. And another prominent company reached out to me for an interview. Honestly, that one was hard to look the other way from. <laughs> I informed them as well that I had decided to stay with the company I'm with. Dr. Price, all this happened within a four-week span, the beginning of March when we were told we we, when we were told we lost the uh, recomp, recomp, yeah. <laughs> when we were told we lost the recompete. Okay. Uh, also, listen again to your CD, "The Battle of the Mind: Our Thought Life and Our Armor." I do have an admit. I do have to admit, though, it was a battle, and not an easy one. I would wake up in the morning, and the enemy would throw fiery darts at my mind. What you gonna do? You know, it's a recession. You know so-and-so has been looking for a job for over a year now. They ain't found nothing. Ain't nobody hiring. I rebuked him in the name of Jesus and told him God's word and what God told, said about it. I would go into work, and when people on the current job were talking negatively, I never gave way to it. I would say with my mouth, even though they couldn't hear it, I heard it, and God heard it. I would say God's word. Here we are four weeks later after being told my job was going away to me transforming or transferring into a new area within the company. Everything about the way God did this was so smooth, nobody but God. Nobody but God. All this because I have my B.A. born again experience. Thank you, Dr. Price. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That's a good report. Take strong faith to do that. Otherwise, you'd give in to the, to the situation that, as we find it in the natural. All right. Now, uh, we were looking at this last time. Principle number one, we must know the reality of the Word of God. This is God speaking to me. Now, Ephesians 6, verse 17. It says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, we know that a sword is a weapon, okay? And it tells us here to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So God's Word is and can be for us, if we choose to believe it and act on it, a weapon that we can use against the enemy. Not a feeling, it's God's Word. He said and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. Now, I pointed this out before, and I don't want to go into any detail now. You could get the recording of last time's message. But that word spirit in that 17th verse is capitalized, which traditionally would indicate that that's referring to the Holy Spirit. But remember again that our Bible were translated out of a foreign language by humans. And sometimes based on their educational background, theological training, denominational exposure, sometimes it's difficult for a person to stay true to an interpretation without dragging into it all their previous things that they've been exposed to. And so they left this word spirit capitalized, which it should not be. Now you say, well, who do you think you are to say that it should not be? You ain't write no Bible. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a good question. It does make me angry. Oh, I should take that person out, please. Okay, <laughs> I'm not angry. <laughs> I'm not mad. Okay, but I, we looked at this before, but I want you to see this because it's so critical and important. Go back uh, verse to verse 10, this same chapter. 
And the scriptures, I said this before, the Bible basically will interpret itself if you know what to look for. So that you're not just stuck with what Fred Price says or anybody else says. Okay, watch this number. Verse 10. We looked at this a while ago. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. You don't need armor unless you have opposition. So right there is implied I'm going to have somebody coming against me. He says, put on the whole armor. And the word whole implies the armor must be in parts. Amen. So I got to be sure to put the whole armor on. So he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able didn't say you would, but you would be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 12, for we do not, oh, now this is the key, watch this now, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness or wicked spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to fall I mean stand verse 14 stand therefore having girded your waist with truth having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace above all say above all, above all. taking the shield of faith with which you will be able didn't say you would do it but you would be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one that's why you need the armor Verse 17, and, say and, and, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So, he says we don't fight against flesh and blood. It's a spiritual warfare. And we are spirits. We have souls. We live in a body. But Satan's attack against us will be spiritually oriented. So, this word spirit should be small case, meaning our recreated human spirit. That's where Satan is coming. He's not coming against the Holy Spirit. He's coming against our recreated human spirit, the real us, in other words. Okay? So he says, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So this is our weapon. Okay. I'm sure you've seen it in Robin Hood and other movies like that over the years, or maybe you read it in books, and, and you have the the, the, the or pirates or whatever it might be of the Caribbean or wherever, and they get into these fights. And the object is to run your enemy through or chop, cut off his head or arm or whatever. And it's a weapon that's used with your hand, right? Okay, sword. But now watch this. He says sword of the spirit. How do you use this sword? Since it's spiritual, I can't even see it. So, so how do I use it? Good question. Go now to Matthew chapter 4. Because if you don't know how to use your weapon, the enemy will take you out. I remember I saw a movie one time, <laughs> and uh, this, this person saw something going on and, and thought that they would intercept it and stop it. And so the person that this girl thought was going to do damage to her partner, she came up from beneath the ship, she was down in the, in the cabin, and she saw this gun. So she picked up the gun, and she came up and opened the, the little cubby hole and looked out there, and she saw this guy standing right behind her partner. So she thought that the guy was going to do her some harm, do him some harm. So she said, okay, stand right where you are. She pulled the gun out, put it right up, and said, okay, put your hands up, so and so and so and so. So then the fellow that was in front of the fellow that was standing that she thought was going to do damage to the person that was sitting said well he said see so and so uh, I told you she's a not a very good a good agent but uh, she has other other properties that are pretty good and because uh, she's a fine looking girl and so she so the girl said oh I'm so sorry she realized that the guy was actually on the same team she said I'm so sorry so he took the he took the gun from her hand said she said she said I almost I almost shot you and so he took the gun and said, yeah, you almost killed me if you had taken the safety off. <laughs> so my point is, she had a weapon, but it wouldn't have done any good because it was a safety. So even if she pulled the trigger, it wouldn't fire. See what I mean? So it, it, you can have the Word of God if you don't know how to use it. The enemy will still take you out. 
All right, Matthew 4, let's find out how you use this weapon because it's the weapon of your recreated human spirit, not a metal sword. It's a spiritual thing. But how do you use it? All right, here we are. Matthew 4, if you have it, say, I have it. Verse 1, then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now, when the tempter came, not when God came, but when the tempter came, tempter and God are two entirely different people. People always want to blame God, but he's not the tempter. He's not tempting. Look at this very carefully. It says, let me go back to verse 1 again. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by God? No. Be tempted by the devil. Well, I don't believe there's no devil. Well, that's because you're stupid. <laughs> you know, Bible stupid. Ignorant. Ignorant of the Bible. I mean, you're, I mean, I know you're smart, and I know you've created several universes, but the one that created this one that we live on, he believes in the devil, and you're a fool if you don't believe in the devil. I didn't say believing to follow him, but at least that he exists. God believes that he exists. The Bible says it right here. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So he must be alive. And when he had fasted 40 days, that's Jesus, and 40 nights afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, he said, the tempter said. Now you would have thought that he would have crept up behind Jesus, picked up a rock and hit him in the head and taken him out. No, this thing is spiritual, and the way that the spiritual principles are activated is with your mouth. Watch this now. Verse 3, now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, they're dueling. They're dueling now, but it's with words. This program is now available to you on compact disc or DVD. CD copies are available for your love gift of any amount. DVD copies are available for your love gift of $15 or more for the ongoing support of this ministry. Call the number on your screen or write to Dr. Frederick K.C. Price, Box 90,000, Los Angeles, California, 90009. Indicate the number you see on your screen and join us again on Ever Increasing Faith, bringing to you the power of faith to transform your life. No structure can exist without a firm foundation. It anchors and supports everything else that is built upon it. It's the same with your Christian faith. You need a solid foundation in order to grow in the things of God. Dr. Frederick K.C. Price wants to help you with a free book entitled Building on a Firm Foundation. This vital book contains teachings on salvation and what it means to the believer. Foundation, the six principles of faith. The Holy Spirit and what it means to speak with other tongues. Divine healing, the children's bread and tithes and offerings, God's financial plan. These areas are so critical to building your Christian faith that Dr. Price wants to send you this book absolutely free. That's right, absolutely free. Call the number on your screen or write to Dr. Frederick K.C. Price, Box 90,000, Los Angeles, California, 90009. Building on a firm foundation. Call or write today. Produced by Ever Increasing Faith Ministries and you, our faithful friends and partners in this area. Thank you.